So a couple of things. And if you want to wear those, you can. You don't have to. We may play a song or something. Oh, okay. Sure. But you don't. Ha- you definitely don't have to. That's all right. Um, a couple of things. I was talking to my wife. She's a massive fan of yours. And she was like, someone in like her fifth grade talent show saying Concrete Angel. Fifth grade wow. talent. Wow. That's what I said. And she said, she was singing a lot of your songs. She goes, you know, someone in a fifth grade talent show, they didn't really know what it meant. They just liked the song. So they got up and sang Concrete Angel and nobody really told the girl it was a very serious song. Mm-hmm. Which, again, that is a very serious song. But there's a kid singing in a talent show thinking it's like a happy song. That would be a, a peculiar situation if you really know what the song's about. Like mm-hmm. to see a kid or anybody... Or just somebody screaming. I don't know what half the songs are I sing along to. Right. So when you have a song like that, do you have to treat it extra sensitively in performance even as well? Because it is, in at least in my mind, a lot of other folks who've seen the video, who know the song, do you have to treat it a certain way as well whenever you perform it? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, first of all, that you said that about the child singing it because it's really super popular with little kids. And I think that they... Um, don't understand completely what it's about, but I think they they it's about a child, right? You know, so it's, some part of them relates to it and is empowered by it, I guess. Um, but yeah, when I'm singing that song, it's I don't do it in, live in the show very much anymore. But um, this is kind of like yeah. it's not a downer, but you know what I mean. Yeah. It's like very serious. So, and when I was recording it, when I chose it, I was. I went back and forth. I think I listened to it for the album before and then finally just said, I have to record this song. It's so good. But yeah, you have, it's a, there's a sensitivity to it for sure. You know, you kind of, I try not to look into the audience because if I see somebody <laughs> emotional, I get sure. emotional. So, you know, but yeah, there's a sensitivity to those kind of songs when you perform them. You have to have that. I would also think, and this is just a theory, t- you can hit me and tell me I'm wrong. If you've performed that song 10,000 times or something that I do over and over and over again, Although I know the impact of the meaning, if you do it a whole lot, it just starts to be a part of a process. And that you'd have to read, because there are times there have been like news stories, but you have to recheck yourself and go, okay, this is the one time somebody's going to see me do this. I can't, it, there can't be any Snickers or anything. Right, like, right. Even though I've done it 10,000 times, yeah. and I'm like, you got to treat this as serious as you possibly can, yeah. because somebody that's just seen you do it once, you got to do it like they, what yeah. they feel about the song. Yeah, there's a responsibility there. Um, I, I will say that after I have to check in every once in a while, I'm kind of in the process of doing that now of really going through all of the lyrics and really start, cause I have two months off from the road and my part of my process, this two months off is really going to be reconnecting with those lyrics again, because you're right. It does get to be not just a performance, but like, you know, you, you really have to check in and make sure that you understand the seriousness of the lyric, even if it's a happy song, you yeah. know what I mean? So that, like that too, same. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's you, if you just do it something over and over and over, regardless of what it is, it just becomes part of the process. And I have to do it too. You know, even with the happy, that's a great point. We do a segment on our show that we've done for like 15 years. It's all about positivity. And I have to remember, because sometimes I hate doing the segment because I've just done it so many times. <laughs> yeah. And we get all this research back and it's like number one testing, number one, and I have to go, you know what? Some people are only hearing this twice a week. Right. And I need to approach it like it's the only time they're going to hear this, and I need to feel great about it. But, yeah, once you do it so many times, why? Because I didn't know that. Why the process with the song? You, you know, you didn't choose it, and then you chose it later. Like, what were you bouncing between? I just think the heaviness of it. I think I'd, I can't remember chronologically where that song came in my body of work, but I feel like, Probably after some, I'd probably had a few heavy songs before that. You know, I had Independence Day, Broken Wing. Um, and so, and Love's the Only House and just some things. And I think that I just thought, wow, this is maybe heavier than any of those. Because it's about, a well, I guess Independence Day is about a child too. But, you know, it's it's definitely hard hitting and very honest. And there's no kind of um, skating around it with the lyric. You know, it's really just... It's real, hard. it's it's real, and it's real life for some people. And so I just kind of thought, I don't know, man. I, I do that sometimes with songs. I'm Gonna Love You Through It was the same way. I just kind of hesitated for a minute because I thought, is it, how, is, how is this going to be, like, is anybody going to really want to sit through this? Mm. And then- Like I, a set list of 
D, like, or, or a record? Or what are you e, thinking? To, what are you on thinking? the record. Got it. Um, you know, and, and I just, but at the end of the day, I just thought to myself, I, I have to, you know, it's just, then it just becomes sort of, you have to listen to your gut. And I'm like, I have to record this song. And, um, and it was released as a single, of course, and was a hit. So it's like, that is a different, I think we have a different landscape, you know, now. I don't know if Concrete Angel was released in 2023, if it would have ever get played on the radio. I don't know, because I think now authenticity wins. It doesn't even have to be the sonically the best song anymore. As long as like people believe that it's real, even if it's real stupid, if it's presented real stupid. But I think it is so... I, I think it would be a hit. I think it would be a hit now. You're right, the landscape is so different. Yeah. But I do think the honesty of it still holds true to today, because sometimes we'll play it. It'll, I don't pick a lot of the music that we're playing because we're, we're doing a national show. But it'll come on occasionally, it's three or four of your songs. And I'm like, dang, this song still hits. Like, it still has, you know, you watch an old movie or an old TV show, mm -hmm. like MASH will come on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, it doesn't quite hold up, but I can see why then it was good. Yeah, yeah. But with some, of the, especially Concrete Angel, Independence Day, you kind of get the same feeling. Like, yeah. like, oh, like that's it. Did you ever worry about, maybe worry is not the word, having so many serious songs that you then would become the seri the the person who sang all the serious songs like typecast even I don't know if consciously that was a thought process I don't know if that if I kind of you know interpreted it that way but I think that was yeah maybe that's part of the hesitation of re of recording another one mm -hmm. of those kind of songs you know? I never thought that about you until you started to list them all off together because <laughs> I know your body work just listening to it through my life mm hmm Never once did I go, you know, Martina, she does all those serious songs. Really? But it's, right? But that's consumer right. versus the person who's living it every single day. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're doing your set now, like what's the biggest pop? When, when, when what song starts? What notes hit and everybody knows this is it? This is the loudest. Uh, for sure, Broken Wing and Independence Day. But this one's for the girls gets really good response. It, it's, it's just such a lift in the show. You know, I think we do it right after Love's the Only House. And it's just... This we that guitar Dan Huff guitar riff starts and everybody's you know I always say you know this is for all my girls out there and everybody just stands up and sings along and it's a real high high point in the show. I would stand up and sing along too and you'd be like you're not a girl but I'd no, be like you know I'd be like that's tough I'm here I love it so I'm going. <laughs> that's so funny you say that because I always say I look out there every night and there's inevitably like the biggest manliest burliest guy <laughs> just standing up and singing at the top of his lungs and i'm like i love you that, that would be so me cool. except without the manly and burly part but i would be <laughs> up there singing at the top of my lungs i was talking to a friend earlier today we were up at the the radio st studio the other one and i said hey martina's gonna come by and and i expected her to say because she went wow she like lit up a little bit i thought she would be like wow i love this song she went right to your cookbooks really yeah and she was like i love do you have two mm-hmm she said, I love, I don't know which one. And that was the first thing she thought about whenever I said your name wow. was, was your ventures into cooking. And mm -hmm. so how much time do you spend with that now, even recreationally? Do you still cook and love to cook? Every day. Really? As much as I can every day. I, if I'm home off the road for only like three days I'm, and somebody wants to invite us out to dinner or I, I'm like kind of bummed. Because I'm like, ah, oh, that's one night I don't get to cook. You love to cook I love still. it. And it's so, I'm so lucky, you know, that I found another passion. Some people only get one passion in their life and one sort of thing that they can give. And I'm just really lucky that I found that I just love to cook. And I love, to, you know, to, I'm thinking about writing another cookbook. And it seems like lately, just lately, like maybe in the past month or two, it started, people have started to really resonate with that part of of me you know do you keep notes in your phone if like oh this would be a cool recipe or this would be something cool to do in a cookbook the same way you would if you have a song idea yeah yeah absolutely and i'm i'm, I'm a paper and pen girl so mm. i'm i like i sit down and write down this chicken pot pie was great <laughs> yeah Thanks. i write like what what changes i want to make next time but i'll tell you that i don't want to get off on cooking because it's not no, everybody's please um, do I, cup of tea, but we have all the time but like the I started out, oh, first of all, I'm not a trained cook, so I'm not a chef. I'm like a home cook, and I am still learning every day. But I started out just following that recipe, you know what I mean? Like, if it says a half a teaspoon of salt, I'm going to put a half a teaspoon of salt. I'm not varying from any of this. And then now, it's so much more fun because I've cooked enough and I've had enough experience to really be able to riff, 
you know? So mm-hmm. I can say, well, I want to add some tarragon to this chicken salad, or I want to, you know, I think that this would, uh, maybe I want to cook it, even prepare it a different way, because I know techniques now a little bit better. Sounds like you can play jazz when you cook, because you're so comfortable <laughs> in that key, and you can just kind of, you can you can riff it yeah. on whatever. And that, that's that's kind of what makes it fun, is when you can use your instinct and experience to to create and make it your own, and and um, I think so many people are intimidated by cooking. You know, I am really, yeah, and by people who can do it really well, both mm-hmm. because it's an art. And my grandma was a great cook, and she had to learn how to cook because she grew up in the you know the depression, mm-hmm. and you know she had to find things and learn how to make them halfway decent. Yeah, so she was great when she actually had real ingredients. And so she was awesome. My wife is such a good cook that when I met her, she was like, I'll cook dinner. And I, I laughed because I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you're pretty. You, you probably don't cook. And she's like fantastic. But like you, she now has the ability to go, oh, let's try a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Because mm-hmm. she was raised cooking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an intimidating thing. Somebody who can really like chef it up. Yeah. Because it's an art and it's science to it as well. And I'm terrible at it. So that's also why it's intimidating. Like I've tried. We, I made cookies the other night. This is not even cooking. This is baking. It's not <laughs> oh, even. Oh, baking's harder. Well, let me tell you the story. I there are cookies in a pack. Oh, I literally <laughs> oh, snap. have to just put them on a plate <laughs> for preheat the oven to like 350. Put them in. I put them in. I'm looking at them through the light. I keep the light on. I know that. Keep the light on. And I, while they're in there, I push them, and they're still so soft. I'm like that, we can't be done. And so she says, "Are they done?" I said, "I don't know that." They're still way soft. She goes, how long have you been there? I said, 15 minutes. She goes, well, it said eight. And I said, yeah, but they're still so soft. There's no way they're done. She goes, no, you got to pull them out, and then they get hard. I didn't, oh. know, I didn't know that. So I pulled mm-hmm. that, and they were all burnt. Oh, yeah. yeah so I'm, kind of, I'm just an idiot, basically, when no. it comes to cooking. Baking's harder. I wasn't really baking. I was just literally just taking You were just plopping things I, I was on. just trying to count to eight minutes and pull them out, <laughs> and that, that didn't work. So a third cookbook, huh? Yeah. Uh, what would be the difference? Like, what, what would you do differently in this one? You know, that's the hardest part of a cookbook for me. It's like, first of all. With anything that I do creatively, I, I, I think this is a process for a lot of people. Sometimes I have a really concrete idea, like about what would I want a record to sound like. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know, I don't know, you know? Like, so for me with a cookbook, it's like, where do I start? Like, what? Wh- everybody always wants an angle. Like, is it a vegetarian cookbook? Is it a 30 minutes and let under on the table cookbook? Sure. Is it, you know? So I, I'm just kind of stuck at, as to what, where to start. I mean, for me, like, cook, cookbooks are like a collection of favorite recipes which i think that's enough right uh-huh. what does it have to have isn't that the angle could that be the angle it Bobby? could <laughs> well so my wife did some just she moved here pandemic everybody was doing whatever just to stay sane mm-hmm. and she's not someone who likes to be on camera but she loves to cook so i was like hey let's do some cooking videos mm-hmm. and i'll hop in some of them with you and she did she did them really well and she was like i don't really like being on camera but well food network called her and and they were awesome. like they were like would you like they didn't offer a show or anything but they were like what we like to do is put people who are good on some of these panel shows and they can like judge and, uh-huh. and she was like ah that's really not for me like thank you but you know I appreciate that and so I tried to learn while she was doing it you know while she was cooking I tried to learn from her a little bit but she, it was also like what's the theme she's like I don't even know like what's the theme of this video like everybody wants like a gimmick mm-hmm. as to what we're going to create and how we're going to create it and when we got married we got sent like 300 recipes from her family wow that was like the there's gift. a cookbook right there yeah. That's right. I was like, that's the theme. We already have it written for us. We'll just take yeah. credit for it. Yeah. Caitlin's Family Recipes. There yeah. we go. Stamp it. There you go. Mail it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were out doing the Judd's tour. Mm-hmm. So were you filling in? Were you part of that? Because I know there were some changes once the death happened. Mm-hmm. Um, or were you already on that tour? I was already on the tour. So they asked me um, back in the summer. Well, I don't know. I guess we toured in the fall. So in the summer to be to come on the, every show and do 45 minutes. Oh, like a full set. Like a full set yeah. before the, before every show. And then they were going to have, well, then it was going to be Winona and Naomi. And then when Naomi passed, they restructured and had, still wanted me to be on every show, thank goodness, and then had um, several other women fill in. So there was Kelsey Ballerini, Ashley Judd, Trisha Yearwood, Brandi Carlisle, mm. Tanya Tucker, um, I'm forgetting someone. Faith was on a show. And so, you know, so I got to, yeah, I got to be on every show. The story of Tanya Tucker and your dad, like talking to you. Yeah. Because you grew up a Tanya Tucker fan. Yeah. I think like most anybody, I grew up in rural Arkansas, so you ha- you almost had to be. Yeah. 
so what is the story? I know you were in a family band for a while. Mm -hmm. And so was that passed down through you, the, the, Tanda, the Tanya Tucker fandom? You know, was your dad, your mom fans? Yeah. We, you know, I was, my dad had a cover band that played on the weekends. And so we would just play like whatever was on the radio. So I, I sang in the band. I sang Texas When I, you know, When I Die, I May Not Go to Heaven, Texas When I Die. And a couple of her other songs. And I went, one of my first concerts actually was, well, I, went to see, I think my first concert might have been Alabama with my parents. But then I went to see, we went to see Tanya Tucker in this little town in Kansas, about 30 miles from where I grew up. And um, so I, my mom passed three years ago. So I call my dad every night um, since that. And so I was on, Tanya asked me to come over to her bus um, after one of the shows just a couple weeks ago. And so I, I went over there and we were visiting. She was playing me music. It was really, really awesome. And I said, I have to go because I have to call my dad. And she goes, well, let's call him. Call him oh, up. I'd love to talk to your that's dad. That's awesome. And it was so sweet. Were you like, dad? Or did you say, <laughs> I don't know. How do you set it up? I think I just said, hey, dad. I'm, I've got, you know, and then she just jumped in. She's like, hey, dad. It's that's, Tanya. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. What's Sharon Kansas like? Um, there's about 140 people that live there. It's very rural. Um, it's about 90 miles from Wichita, which is the biggest city in Kansas. And it's just like, like, a, like dirt streets, no stoplights. There's a couple of, maybe three churches. Um, there's no grocery store. There are no restaurants. Gotta be a dollar store though. No. Really? No, no. It's tiny. Wow. But cause I'm from a town of 700 and we just got a dollar store. There you go. And then it turned into two dollar stores. Wow! Not a two dollar wow. store, but two dollar <laughs> stores that now compete for that seven hundred people. Wow! So you had no tra how many traffic lights? None. Stop signs. Yeah, us too. We didn't have a we didn't have a traffic light. And either. dirt streets. There was there's a couple. There's a couple of paved streets, but mostly the side streets are all dirt streets. And what about the school? What did you have like Sharon Elementary? We had elementary through high school, and then like I had ten people in my graduating class. That is small. I thought. 40. I had 40 and I was, the, yeah. this, wow, that's a whole different level. We had 38, the year I graduated, we had 38 students in the whole high school bot, student body. Did they combine classes ever? Nope. Of, no. So there, I mean, if there the were class, 10 people, it was, yeah. it was 10. The class after me was five kids. Wow. And the year my brother graduated, he's two years younger than me, they shut down the school and consolidated, which really was just the end of the really the end of the town because there were no more team sports really in that town. Mm. And there were, I don't know, the high school was really the hub of the whole town. So. So the band that you were in with your, your dad, your family band, was it called the shifters? Mm -hmm. And so was he a musician when he was younger? Did he ever try? Like, I'm going to give this the real try to make it as an artist or was he always just someone who loved it recreationally and got pretty good at it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he was, he was a farmer as well and a woodworker he built houses and things like that. And, um, he, like entered some contests when he was a kid, but just never really thought of actually like picking up and moving to Nashville. Is it because nobody else did it? So he didn't know it was a real thing? I don't know. Cause that, that was nobody else I knew did it either, yeah. but it was a whole different, you know, generation. But like, I don't know why. I mean, I think he was really, really happy playing in that local band. It was kind of a big deal. We were like, you know, regionally respected and, and we worked a lot. And I think that, you know, that was, that was good for him. I mean, that was probably good enough for him. How was he when it came to you doing your own thing, support-wise? Very supportive. My parents were both very supportive. They, they always said, you know, we didn't come from a lot of, like, college graduates. So it was, going to college wasn't really that important. It was, you know, for me, I think everybody, we just always assumed that I would sing in some capacity. And um, they always said, when I, when I decided to move to Nashville— my husband and I decided to move to Nashville. We'd just gotten married about a year before that, um, or two years. My parents were always like, look, somebody's got to make it, right? Like, literally, maybe tomorrow there's going to be a new artist that gets signed and makes a record. Why couldn't it be you? Wow. If you get in the right place at the right time and you work really hard, why not? Why not you? And I was like, yeah. So I think, you know, probably like you, when you have, when you have, when you grow up with something that you, it's just kind of part of you. You have a confidence, you know, especially when you're young. Mm -hmm. You have a confidence that I, I, I could probably do this. A little naive, a little confident. Yeah. It's a real lethal mix at yeah. times. And I think you have to see it. 
Like, I think you have to be able to visualize walk. I'm like, for me, I always visualize walking up on CMA steps and accepting an award. You know, I think you have to see it. Otherwise, you won't go for it. Especially if there's no one around you that can tell you that it can be a reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Mountain Pine, Arkansas, nobody left. You worked at the mill or you worked in Hot Springs. That was it. And so there was never anybody that was like, this is a reality. You can actually pursue it. But at the same point, there was nobody that said it. You couldn't. It was just a TV thing. It was like fairy tale. Yeah. Probably like moving to Nashville. Yeah. But to have parents that were so optimistic. Yeah. Like what an asset for a kid. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, also just being able to watch the CMA Awards or watch Hee Haw or watch whatever we watched and see, you know, Loretta Lynn and Tanya Tucker and, and Reba and all of these amazing women doing that. I mean, you just saw, you saw yourself there. You're like, well, I could do that. I mean, she's from Oklahoma, you know, mm-hmm. a little town in Oklahoma, um, little town in, in Kentucky. Like, they came from small towns. Why couldn't I do that? When you were singing as a kid, when did people start to treat you special? Like, oh, you're better than other kids at that age doing that thing. It's interesting because, you know, I'm very, we, Kansas is very Midwestern in, in a lot of ways. And, praise isn't really something that's bandied about. Like it's not really freely given. So they think you're going to get an an ego or a big head or something. So like kids are like, I think I recognize that people recognize that what I did was good. I was the only kid that did it. Like everybody else was into sports and things like that. So, but it wasn't, nobody was going around going, oh my God, you're, you're, you know what I mean? So I think I probably recognize that it made people pay attention and made people happy when I was probably about seven years old. That is a lot younger than I thought you were going to say. Yeah. Could, could you, like, nail pitch at seven? Yeah. You know, I, I was a belter. You know, I was, I, I, and I didn't have any lessons. We didn't have, like, my lessons that were in high school, the way I learned to sing was from listening to records and singing along with records, like Linda Ronstadt records, Bonnie Raitt records, Reba records, um, and singing those cover songs in the band. That was really how I learned to increase my range and try to match their nuances and their, all of it, you know, how long they held notes, how big the sound was. And so, um, I forgot your question, but. Well, just about other kids treating you different and you at seven being able to hit, just match a pitch oh, yeah. at all. But you yeah. did, you just got it from listening. I just got it from listening. And you know, we we lived way we I didn't live in the town the booming town of Sharon Kansas I lived on a farm about ten miles away the suburb of Sharon obviously yes it was like a literally ten miles down or eight miles down a dirt road and then there's a house and and my grandparents lived a mile down the road before you got to my house so it's very isolated and we my mom didn't drive so until we could drive we were just you come home from school you're there. Like, you're not going to run around and go down to the corner. You know what I mean? It's just like, so my parents always had instruments for us, though. Piano, guitar. We, we had little tape recorders that we would record ourselves um, messing around on the, out, you know, in the utility room, me and my brother, my younger brother. So that was our entertainment and, I, and records. And I can remember having kids home from school, like my classmates, to play after school or to stay all night or whatever. And we would, I would be playing them all these records. And they, they just didn't, I found a friend in high school that was a little older than me that, that loved music like I did. But, you know, most of the kids in my school were just not that interested. It was just music. It was just like background, you know? And so I would, we would sit and listen to records and they, after about 30 minutes, they'd be like, is this all we're going to do? Like, <laughs> let me go outside and play. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Your music maturation, I guess, jumped quickly because that's what you had a lot of at the house. Yeah. What, did your parents care what kind of music you listened to or the rules on what you couldn't listen to? Um, at 12, 13, 14 years old? I don't know if it was rules, but there was, they, they, my, my dad was a country fan. Like he, like I somehow, my old, I have an older brother and an older sister. My older brother was into like Credence, Clearwater and, um, I don't know, just like really cool rock bands. And my sister was into pop, like Livy Newton, John and Casey and the Sunshine Band, whatever was on the radio. And so I got those influences from there. But when we were in the car, it was tr- specifically with my my parents country music and my mom loved like she loved more like crooners like um like nashville sound type crooner or no, like that? yeah no like like you know like frank sinatra oh, we like didn't the, have any frank sinatra records crooners, but, yeah like, got it got it like the rat pack guys yeah. those 
a buble now. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad loved, he did love Ray Charles. And, and so we did have Ray Charles records and Etta James. So, but then I got into high school and I got into like, like my first concert that I went to without my parents was Ozzy Osbourne right? The Blizzard of Oz tour. <laughs> it, was, it's, it was so like rock and roll and was so exciting to me. And um, so some of that music I would listen to with headphones. Yeah. You finish high school, you go to college. Now you mentioned college a minute ago because there wasn't a lot of college graduates in your family. Mm-hmm. Same here. So it was a whole new world to me. Again, I'm, I'm somewhere. I don't really have yeah. anybody to lean on to go, how do I do this? Uh-huh. How was your experience with college? Short-lived. I went to a community college. I got a, um, a scholarship for music and, and academic, and I went there. Okay, so, but we, like, my kids grew up in Nashville and had have all of this college prep. They've got a college counselor. They've got all of these people that help them know what to expect, help them with the application process, all of that stuff. Okay, I had the opposite of college, of college prep. I had no college prep. So I show up. I ha- I'm literally so overwhelmed. I don't know. This whole schedule thing, you know, and and how you have to find your classes, and and it was just completely overwhelming to me. Plus, I was living off campus. I was um, singing in a rock band, and I was working at Dairy Queen. I had a boyfriend, so I had a lot going on that was pulling me in a lot of directions. But I went one semester and was just like, I don't know what I'm doing at all. <laughs> the fact that you came from such a small school, and I'll speak from experience as well. It's more than just not having college prep as well. It's like a culture change. Yeah. Going from 10 kids in a class to it doesn't matter, a community college, a mid-sized school. Like that is like moving to New York City. Or was yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. So it not only was, wow, nobody in my family's ever been to college before. I'd never been around so many people. Right. Yeah. And it's always all been on me. But now I'm having to go and do the same thing. Yeah. And so speaking of your rock band, the Penetrators. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. Well, uh, you're in a room. Who says it? Let's go with it. <laughs> well, I, I, okay. But in my defense. <laughs> you don't I, need a defense. Well, I'm just no, asking. The, I was 17 yeah. years old when okay. I joined that band. And I'd lived a pretty sheltered life. <laughs> and we didn't have the, you know, internet or anything like that. Three channels on the TV. One was fuzzy. So, like, I just didn't get it. Like, I I'd really, not until, I think, years later, when, some, when somebody said something, I was like, Oh my God. I was just like, yeah, the penetrators will penetrate you with our music. <laughs> <laughs> what well, what role did you have when you entered the band at first? Were you pure front front man? Yeah. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. And did they not have a singer before or were you just way better than the one they already had? They had one and she she quit or moved or something. Um and so yeah, they they actually one of the guys in the band owned worked at a um like a music store that my parents frequented, you know, when we'd go to the big town of Wichita or whatever. So they actually came down and talked, sat in our living room and talked to my parents. They were, these were older, you know, I don't know, I guess they were probably in their mid twenties, thirties and said, you know, we want more. T- I, I, looking back on it, it seems like a blur. I don't really rem- cognizantly remember like having that. Co- I kind of remember sitting there going, okay, these guys want me to sing in their rock band. I, I, I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> I love it. You know? And my parents were like, well, you seem like good good people, you know, they kind of gave their blessing. And I spent the next year and a half riding around in a van with a hole in the floor, you know, pooling all of our money together to, to, to get one, two jars of peanut butter and two loaves of bread. And like, that's what we were going to eat for the week. You know what I mean? It's like just playing locally, but scream, like singing Pat Benatar and heart and journey. And it was, it was fun. Well, you have to be nourished if you're going to penetrate properly. As <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I completely understand. <laughs> and have your protein. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, you mentioned those three artists. Like, what are the, I was going to ask, like, what songs do you hear and it reminds you of that time period? Like, if you hear it on the radio or playing at Walgreens, you mentioned Journey, like, Don't Stop Believing. You're like, oh, no, we did Any Way You Want It. Oh, yeah, good. Any Way You Want It. And we did Pat Benatar. We did, uh, oh, my gosh. Hit me with the best shot. Me. Did you do that? I don't, I don't know if we did that one. I do that live every once in a while now, but we, we did. Promises in the Dark. We did um, Fire and Ice. It was probably a little bit later, Pat Benatar, because I remember when Pat Benatar came out, I was at my grandmother's. I was folding clothes, and I was listening to Casey Kasem's Top 40, and Heartbreaker came on the radio, and I was like, what is mm. that? I was so knocked out by that. Then, She's a dream chaser. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, and then later I got to do Crossroads with Pat Benatar. 
which was man when it all comes back unbelievable around. was that like one of the coolest yeah for sure i for me if i get to hang out with people that i loved as a kid it's way cooler than somebody that could be massive like in celebrity stature yeah but for me to be able to i remember uh like john michael montgomery right like he's been over here and we and to him he's just john and lives in kentucky drove down uh-huh. listens to the show but i'm like I don't know if I need to remind you. You're John Michael Montgomery. <laughs> like that to me is super cool because as a kid, listen to a lot. Yeah. And so for you to be able to do that, that's awesome. It was awesome. And it was so surreal because I thought to myself, okay, never in a million years would I have dreamed that I would be on stage with Pat Benatar singing her songs. But then also I have songs mm-hmm. that she's going to learn and sing. That's so, that's even beyond like, yeah. but no, I'm, it, it's not lost on me. Like when I, I was standing on the stage, um, a couple of weeks ago with Winona and Tanya Tucker and me. And I'm like, and Tanya, you know, was like put her arm around me like, oh my God, I, what am I doing Pierce. here? Like, it's, Pierce. yeah, it's so crazy. And when you, when you kind of allow yourself to look at it that way. Yeah, that's super cool. The penetrators, how long do you guys play before you stop penetrating? <laughs> it was pretty short lived. It seemed like a long time, but I think it was probably... I don't know, because I moved to Wichita to sing in another band five nights a week at a club when I was probably 18, so maybe eight months, a year. At 18, did you kind of have it figured out somehow, some way you were going to sing? Like, Oh, the, yeah. The, did you know you would go to Nashville eventually, or was it, let's just see where it takes me? No, I, I always dreamed of making records and doing, you know, doing the big thing, but I couldn't at that point in my life, 18, 19, 20, really settle on country music. I was kind of rebe- I was kind of like singing all kinds of music. So I was singing with this cover band. I was singing everything from Aretha Franklin to Whitney Houston to Madonna to, you know, just whatever was on the radio at the time, plus some classics like that. And I loved that too. So I was like, I don't know if I'm really ready to go and do country music full time. And I had an aha moment. I, I had to quit singing for a while because I was, I was like waiting tables and singing in clubs five nights a week. And I started to get like some vocal fatigue and that they did a scope and said, you know, you don't have nodules, but they're start, it's look, not looking good. You should probably take some time off from singing. So I did. And in the meantime, of course, I couldn't just completely take a time off singing. So I, so I started singing harmony vocals in this country band, these two brothers called the Fowler Brothers that played locally. So I'd go and sit in and sing harmony. And then I started singing with my dad's band a little bit again. And we did a battle of the bands, which is so weird. We never did that the entire time I was growing up. Who's we, your dad? Me and my dad and that band, yeah. And it was at a club and and it was in Wichita and we did this battle of the bands. And something clicked for me, like a light bulb went off. And I, I I said, one of the DJs that was judging the contest actually said to me, I don't know what you're going to do with your singing because I know you're singing a lot of other stuff, but I hope you decide to sing country music because, you know, that would be really great. And and I, that comment coupled with the experience of singing that music again and realizing how important the lyrics were, how important the singer is, it just felt like home to me. I said to my mom, she was there, she ran the soundboard actually for the band, and I said, I think I've made a decision. I'm, I'm going to move to Nashville and, and pursue a career in country music. And I told my, I asked, you know, didn't tell my husband. Well, I kind of, maybe I kind of did. I think I, think I said, I want to move to Nashville. And he had a local sound company that was doing, you know, local sound and t- touring a little bit regionally. Um, and he was like, all right, let's go. And he moved his entire sound company. We didn't know, we knew John Kay from Steppenwolf because... John had worked with him and toured with him doing monitors. Um, but we really didn't know anybody. And we it, talk about naive. Like I would go, yeah. I knew I had to find songs. So I'd go to these publishing companies and walk up down, walk up and down Music Row and knock on the door and say, I'm a singer and I want to get a record deal. Can you play me some songs that I can record as, for demos? And they're like, um, sure. Come on in. <laughs> like, it was so odd that they were probably slightly welcoming but confused. Yeah. Like you this is really not how it works, but okay. <laughs> I know, right? Wow. So, okay. You were you, mar- you were married at the time? Yeah. You and your husband. So how long had you been married there before we you moved, moved here? We got married in May of 1988, and we moved here January of 1990. That's a that's a pretty adventurous first year and a half there. Yeah. So you get here. You don't know anybody. You're walking up and down. How did you even know Music Row was a thing, though? Well, we ran into... We came down before we moved and made a demo, and... 
actually, we went in to see this guy at a publishing company that John Kay had known. So it's kind of like a friend of a friend and sat down with him and played them, him a demo that we had made back in Kansas. And he said, that's not good. That's not going to cut it. Like, you know, that's not good enough. You need to find real, real musicians. It was recorded in a warehouse. It was like really echoey. He's like, you need to find a studio, record. And he gave us a list of names of, of people that maybe could help us do that, studio musicians. And um, John made a couple of calls. And I think the third person he called was a bass player named Mike Chapman, who said, yeah, I can, I got a friend, Lonnie Wilson, who's a drummer, played on tons of my records. Do you know Lonnie? I know who he is. So yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. And he said, he's got a, a studio in his like rec room or garage or whatever. How about tonight? I'll, I'll put a little band together. You can come out. Cause we were only in town for like three days. And, we, and I went out there and we recorded, um, I don't even, a couple of original songs that one of the, one of the musicians had said, here, you can record these songs. And I was like, I like these songs. <laughs> and, and, um, took it back to the guy the next day. And he said, yeah, that's good enough. That's, that's a real demo. Right. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was just, it was just like meant to be, I guess. Well, it sounds very divine in that the battle of bands happens where there, you had your aha moment where somebody happened to be there and go, Hey, I would like to give you affirmation that mm-hmm. what you're doing here is the right thing. Mm-hmm. Like all those little particles came together. And then you knew somebody that knew somebody. And that person, first of all, not only helped you, let's do it tonight, but it's also like still, like th- that same, ge- he's still in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of that's not coincidental. Right. But pretty cool that when the dominoes fell, you weren't afraid to kind of go with them. Mm-hmm. Because that's also brave. Yeah. You know, to here you are. You're, I don't know, how, how old are you at this time? 22. 20, okay, I'll make a demo with guests. Studio, or 23 maybe. Musicians here. How did you feel singing with experts? Did that, because again, they're the best. They're, they're doing studio work. You got to be really good to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Did you think about that at all? Or were you just like, I, I can sing, let's go? I don't remember. I journal, I have to look up. I got to go. I'm said I'm going to go back, back through and read all of my journals because your perception of things and how it really happened are different. But um, I think I was probably just nervous and blown away and kind of like, but let's do this. You know, it was kind of probably equal parts of, of because, because you know, I, I was in my element musically, but out of my element situationally, you know, so I don't know. You come back with that demo. Do you, pa- when you move here, do you start passing it around? Are you duplicating it? Or are you like, okay, I'm, uh, this will get me into another room where I can then record even more or, or better songs? Yeah, we, we, I think we ended up borrowing some money to move here. And we set up, th- this was like a two song demo. So the songs, the, the next demo that we made was the one where the songwriter said, here, record these songs. Mm-hmm. And um, we, went to, we went to Fireside, I think, and recorded the tracks for like five songs which I just found that demo the other day, by the way. And um, then, we re- then we went to the Music Mill, which is, was, was a big studio here at the time, and recorded the vocals. And then we, so we pitched that around to every record company, got turned down by everybody. Why? I don't know. They just said, we're not looking, it's not what we're looking for. Standard answer, it ain't for us. Yeah. And then I made a second demo. This is all, all within about a year, year and a half. And um, John was out as production manager for Garth. At the, he'd got that sh- job in the meantime. And so I made a, we made a second demo. And I, Mike Chapman, the, ba- the original bass player guy, said, you, you know what you need to do? Somebody had told me at a publishing company, because I was singing demos, they said, we, think, we hear that RCA is looking to sign a female artist. And I was like, okay. So Mike Chapman said, you need to put your demo in, in an envelope and you need to write. They don't just take stuff off the street, which I didn't know. You got to write on their requested material. <laughs> and put a phone number on it. And I was like, all right. So I went down to Kinko's and I got this bright purple envelope. And I wrote, or I think John actually wrote, requested material, Martina McBride, and a phone number. And about three weeks later, we got a phone call from Josh Leo, the head of A&R at the label, who, and they wanted to see a showcase. And we heard through the grapevine, there was like me and two or three other girls. So we put together the, a band and we went to Ace of Clubs. We did a showcase. And they came back that night and said, come in tomorrow and you've got a record deal. Why all that, that advice of just write requested material on there so they'll think that they actually were the ones who wanted this, that that, act, that, that paid off? <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Obviously, it was you who closed. But sometimes you can have all the talent in the world. But if you don't have a way to get that talent mm-hmm. to where it needs to go, it's a tree falling in the woods. Yeah. 
That is so crazy. He's like, just write requested material yeah. and they'll just believe they wanted it and that they were the ones yeah. that were in control the whole time. Yeah. And that's, it worked. And, you know, uh, on my, I think my 40th birthday, Randy Talmadge, the head of A&R, gave me that envelope. He'd saved it all those years. And he, he wow. framed it and gave it to me. And now I think it's in my Hall of Fame exhibit. So it's, yeah, it's, it's wild, you know? That's I really mean, cool. I just think that some things are meant to be. And if you can meet it, you know, if you have enough, enough, determination and sort of passion and perseverance to to meet it where it is you know then it's then it like you said the dominoes start to fall yeah and, and it's okay to fall with them like yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so you've been married 35 or so mm-hmm. years almost so got married for the first time about a year ago mm-hmm. never been married was never engaged was never in a serious anything ever she's the first person i ever told that i love because she was the first person i loved right so i i'm a little stunned in that part of my life because I was just so dedicated to my career mm-hmm. and I met her and it's been a year, a little year, year and a half or so. What is there is, I know there's no universal key. You can't give me a key to the city and I open every door with it. What is it? What's the, what's the secret that's not that secret that is just right in front of me? I think it's determination and, and deciding you kind of decide I'm, I'm going to stick. I mean, unless there's abuse or, you know, if it's just really not healthy, that's a whole different thing. Right. But like, if it's healthy and you found your person who wants to grow with you and encourages you and you la- makes you laugh every day and and has a sense of adventure and all some of the really important things, then um, you just decide we're in this. And there's going to be times when you know maybe you go, oh my god, what have I done? You know what I mean for him and me. But you go, that passes. It passes. Or you talk about it. Or maybe it was just a mood or a season. And then you just, you know, you then you start to have all these shared experiences. And I don't know. I think you, honestly, I think you just decide to be dedicated to it if it's a good relationship. Whenever your success really started to grow, and as a new artist that has a bit of momentum, you're gone a lot. Mm-hmm. People think new artists are just making tons of money. New artists are out grinding harder than anybody. Oh, yeah. Making no money. Uh-huh. How how was that for the relationship with you and your husband? Was that a really hard time, or was he able to take what he does and take that along? A little bit of both. So he was my sound engineer on the road. So he did. We did travel together, and we still do. That really made I think has made things easier than if it would have been a different situation because we get to share everything together. We've kind of grown through this together, and um, but. When we were first, get, when I first got a record deal, he he tells the story of how, you know, he was kind of like my manager for lack of not really, but you know what I mean. He was like the biggest. He wrote on the envelope. He went and dropped it off. He was like a big su- fan, a supporter, and so you know we go do this thing. RCA ha- used to have this thing during um, country radio seminar that was like a boat show. So we went on this General Jackson boat, and all of the radio people were there, and it was like a showcase. Like you did your new material or whatever. So the first time I went on there. My promo guy, my radio guy, came and got me and said, I want to take you around and introduce you to some people. And John says, it's like he just, like, you just left with the real pe- people, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And left, and, and he was kind of left standing there. And, and also, a lot of people weren't, he had to go through a lot of things where till people could get to know him and respect him and not see him as the, the husband that was going to be in the way or, you know, all of those stereotypes that people have. So it was, I would say it was harder for him than me, but, um, you know, once people spend any time with him and recognize his talent and, and his passion and his heart, you know, then that, that came around. 1993, you get inducted into the Grand Ole Opry. You mentioned Loretta Lynn earlier. She's the one who does it. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that night? It was part of a television special. It was like an anniversary of the Opry. And, um, Loretta's so funny. She came she came to do the rehearsal and they gave you they gave me a plaque and she said well during rehearsal she said is this is this what I'm supposed to give you this is what you get for joining the Opry and I said yeah I guess so and so she said she kind of laughed and during the ceremony she said welcome to the Opry honey this is what you get (laughs) (laughs) that's super cool that it was her and She's the one, like, just first of all, anything with her. Yeah. But she's the one inducting you into the greatest country music space right. in the history of the world, mm-hmm. the Grand Ole Opry. Mm-hmm. Like, what a special memory. D- 
did you know that she was going to be inducting you before like rehearsals with it? Because sometimes, you know, they, the invite is a surprise. Was that a surprise to you? Yeah, but they didn't do it like they did. They back didn't just then. show up and surprise that, you at a performance. I went to lunch with the head of the Opry, and he asked me at lunch, and and the, and then I got to I got to invite I got to ask who I wanted to induct me. So got I it. chose. So Loretta. you chose Loretta. Mm-hmm. Okay, man, being told at lunch by someone who an executive is like being proposed to on the phone. <laughs> so it's like I mean, you're still getting married, and that's awesome, but yeah. you, you, just, you didn't even get on a knee. But yeah, I don't think they did it like that back then. Now I love how they do it now, where they. I got to be that person for Charlie Daniels. I got to ask him to join the Opry. And he didn't know you were there? You guys kept it completely secret? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, was, that's the fun. greatest. Those videos where people are surprised. Just through the, I would say the history because you're right. They didn't do it like that 25 years ago. Yeah. I think like 20 years. Yeah. They started doing it a little bit. But those videos where people get surprised and they're awesome. like, oh, my God, they're awesome. Only second to whenever somebody from the military comes home and surprises oh. their kids. Those videos. Man, those are good too. Yeah. What I don't like when they show the videos of the dogs with one eye and Sarah McLaughlin sings. Those videos I don't like, <laughs> but I like what they're doing. I just don't like those videos. Yeah. Like, you know, what comes to me. Um, you sign a record deal, 91. How fast until you actually take off and have a hit? From the moment you signed until you're on the radio and you got a number one song. Yeah. It was a second record. I, my, I didn't have a number one song until the third record. Wild Angels was my first number one. It actually just happened the other day. I think it was in 1996. So it took six, five or six years to really get to that place. But I, but before Wild Angels, I had Independence Day. And I had oh, my first three. Independence Day wasn't the number one song. No, it was number 10. Maybe. Again, I'm just the consumer here. The song that I would know you for the most. Yeah. My, it's, w- wasn't even a number one song. Right. That's a whole story. Like, you know, we had a lot of resistance at radio with that song. Because... The subject matter. And I think it was really because she, she burned the house down. <laughs> you know, it was like she, was take, she took action that just didn't set very well with a lot of radio, uh, radio people. Bizarre. <laughs> and so it's funny because I was so passionate about that song. Like it literally changed my life, not career, only career-wise, but just my awareness and my, you know, wanting to, to try to help some way and all the letters that I got and the people that I talked to and heard their stories. And it, it, it was so big. It, for me. And so my r- pro bono guy, once again, Mike Wilson came to me and he said, I think we're losing the song. I don't think that we're, it's going to um, make it. And I was like, what? How is this possible? And, and he goes, well, there's, there's, a you know, maybe 20 stations that won't, won't refuse to play it. And I said, can I talk to them? Can you give me their numbers? And I want to have a conversation. And he, he was like, uh, <laughs> sure, I guess. Like, that's not usually done, but I guess so. And so I got on the phone with these guys, and I was just like, talk to me. Like, tell me, what is it? And some of them would say, we just don't think it's appropriate that it's on our station. And I said, and we, oddly enough, this is right. Independence Day came out maybe seven weeks before Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered. So all of a sudden, it was on, that story was everywhere. And so I was, I said, you know, it's interesting because, you're talking about domestic violence every night, every day, several times a day on your newscast, right? Yet you don't feel like this song can can be listened to or whatever. And I, I turned a couple, few of them around. There were ten stations that never did play it, but but I I was able to. They they would give it a chance, you know. One guy said to me, "That video, like if I'm sitting with my daughter and that video comes on, then I have to talk to her and explain things." And I'm like. Yeah, dude. Call being the dad. Like, that's yeah. maybe not a bad idea. So it was interesting. It's just a different time, you know. Is it odd when people just think that song is about Fourth of July? Yeah. Like on Fourth of July, you hear the song, and you're uh, like, yeah. "No, it's not the same thing, guys." We're not talking about yeah. literal Independence Day of America. Yeah. Because sometimes I'll be like, "It's your July Fourth playlist," and oh, all the t- every year. Yeah. Yeah. And Independence Day comes on, and I'm like, I, I think I think that's what you were talking about earlier. How sometimes you can just sing a song for years and not really ever, you kind of just sing the chorus. And you're distracted during the verses yeah. or whatever. Because I think a lot of people don't know what that song is about still. But then so many people do. And that's, you know, that's the song that I've heard and thought to myself, somebody needs to hear this song. This is going to be the song for somebody. Yeah. And, you know, then I get letters, people saying, that's what I got in the car and I heard that song on the radio. And that's, I decided I'm out of here. I've had enough. Right. So it's like, that's the power. That's not me. That's the power of music and the power of a song. Three questions for you. When you finally win for female vocalist, because you were up a couple times, 
mm-hmm. in like the late 90s, but in like maybe 2003 or so, I think you won the first time. Three in a row, by the way. It was like bam, bam, bam. Yeah, it was ni- 1999. Is that you won mm-hmm. in 99? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the first time you win and you had always been able to envision yourself winning, did you have that moment while it was happening where you're like, I've always, like it, while it was happening, like I always could see this and now it's actually happening. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It was like, uh, not an out-of-body experience, but like, it's so, okay, I want to say this and not have it come off as in a conceited way because I'm not, but, and it's not where it's coming from, but like, well, like it goes back to what I was saying before. You kind of have to believe it. You kind of have to believe it. Otherwise, all of the rejection and the and the being away from home, the traveling and the recording and all of the stuff that you do is, you know, you have to believe that it's going to pay off in that moment, as as in that moment. So, you know, for uh, there was a, I don't know, maybe it might have been even four or five years we were nominated and didn't win, and and you you just go, what's going to happen? It's going to happen. You so you still believed it was going to happen? Oh yeah, yeah. When you got that close and didn't? Yeah. Because it was too, I, maybe premature. Like, I feel like we, one thing I'm really, that was a good feeling for me was when we finally won, I felt like we'd been around long enough to kind of deserve it in a way. And the, my team, you know, everybody that worked so hard, they, it was rewarding. It was just kind of like, oh, I'm so glad it didn't happen too fast. I'm so glad I feel like I'm kind of in this industry and that people really wanted me to win maybe. So, but yeah, there's that moment where you go, well, this is it. Mm. You know, the first times that you didn't win, are you like listening for mm, and it is, oh, is it deflating or is it, do you really feel oh, anytime I ever lose, I'm not honored to be there. Right. I'm like, this sucked. Yeah. Or are you honored just to be there? And you're like, oh, I'll get them next time. Like it, what? Like, yeah. I was kind of like that. I was really, cause I would look at the category and the other females in the category and I was just like, wow, wow. Like it's so amazing that I'm even in the same, like these people even know, I remember when I walked past Alan Jackson one time at an award show, probably the first CMA awards that I went to and he's in the front row and I walked by him and kind of, you know, I was, I'm not, I'm kind of an introvert, really, honestly, extroverted introvert. Mm, Same. So I'm not the kind of, I'm always the kind of person that doesn't want to go up to somebody and introduce myself. I don't want to bother them. You know what I mean? But I walked past him and I just kind of looked at him and thought to myself, oh my God, that's Alan Jackson. And he said, I love your stuff. And I was like, Oh my God! Alan Jackson knows who I am and has heard my music. What in the world? You know, so it's it's it was like that. I don't think you came off conceited at all, and I'm a big believer in what I would call a healthy arrogance. Because if I don't have it, if I don't believe in me so much, nobody else is going to. Yeah. Like I have to, because at times yeah. other people are going to go yep or nope or I don't know, prove it. But if I don't believe in me and I don't believe what I'm putting out is worth people buying a ticket, if I'm doing a comedy show mm-hmm. or spending 20 minutes with me in the morning or reading a book, if I don't believe it. And I don't believe it's great. Nobody else will. Yeah, that's true. So I have to be that. And mm-hmm. I have no problem. It's just for me at times, I think I get so insecure that that healthy arrogance tends to come off the other way because I'm so insecure mm-hmm. that it's like, well, I got to prove to everybody that I don't take any crap and let's let's go. That's my problem. When things started to really pop for me, I had to, there were a couple times where I had to be like, whoa, you got to check yourself. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I have that awareness. I was going to say, you're aware of Luckily. it. Luckily. Yeah. Did, when it, did you ever have to have that talk with you? That's a weird question to ask where you're like, oh, it's hitting now. Like, let's make sure we make these some wise decisions. Not because of an arrogance thing or insecurity, really. But, you know, I just it took me a really long time to realize that I had some power. Like, you know, nobody tells you that (laughs) when you start out. They're like, there's all kinds of people that want you to do what they think you should do. And I mean, everybody from video directors to art directors to producers to everybody executives and it took I think it was my husband actually that said you know you they're kind of working f- mm-hmm. for you in a way and I was like oh my god yeah so then you kind of you can kind of assert your power over your creativity and your own persona and over how yourself. people see you over yourself yeah. and that that can get pretty heady so sometimes I feel like especially I don't you know as a woman I kind of had to check that a little bit just to not alienate everyone that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely it does. My final question is kind of a two-parter. If you go to your home, inside your home, what is your favorite professional picture that you have that if somebody could stumble across? It's in a frame somewhere. And what is your favorite personal picture that you have that somebody could just stumble across? Be like, oh, look at this. Oh, you're duck hunting. I don't know what it could be. <laughs> but give me give me both of them. 
okay, well, my, I don't really have any professional pictures of me framed. But nothing like you had a sh- do, singing at the Opry, anything at all. Any Not in my house, but okay. but a friend of mine, Nathan Chapman, who I think has been on this show. Love him. Yeah, saw him at the We played a show together at the Ryman. Yeah. Yeah, a few days he's, ago. He's a, 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 an amazing human being and my favorite bass player, really. No offense to all the other bass players out there, but he's so good and he's just a great singer and musician and I just love him. I can't say enough good things. But he also, because he's good at everything he does, is an amazing photographer. So he called me up a few weeks ago and said, can I jump on your bus and just, I just want to come out and, and shoot photos. I was like, absolutely. So he took this photo of me to actually one, me going up, up the stairs to the stage and it's kind of blurry and out of focus. It's so iconic. And then another one of me on stage from the back, which is my best angle, by the way. <laughs> and and I, there's nothing for me to critique or pull, pick apart. It's like, it's the back of my head. My hair looks good. It's fine. And so... um that picture, and I haven't got him framed yet, but he made me huge mm. prints, like like as big as that when you have here. So I'm I'm probably gonna frame a couple. That's of That's super cool. What about personally? My one of my favorite pictures is my picture with Loretta. I've I have a couple of snapshots with her that I have framed, um, and I just look at I walk by them, and just think I just was so lucky to know her, so lucky to know her, you know. And then, of course, I've got ki- pictures with my kids when they were from all all through their whole um you know their whole lives i've got some newborn pictures with all of them so you know that's personally sure. i guess when i said when you said personal picture and i said me and loretta i that did feel like a personal relationship to me so but that's probably more in the professional category so pictures of me with my kids would be the second one so you're doing shows a few in may and in june now you're taking a break right now though for the most part mm-hmm. is what you're saying are you going back out in the fall? Mm-hmm. Has that been announced yet? No. Okay. We're well, putting that together. I don't want to go to, to tour jail, so I'm not going to push. <laughs> I don't know what's up. I just decided this year to take a little bit more, try to, try to tour a little smarter, because we were, for the past, since COVID, since, since touring started back up again, we were really hitting it every single weekend, mm-hmm. like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every single week, maybe with a week off here or there. And it just gets to be so discombobulating. There's all there's always this. First of all, I'm a real homebody. I love to be at home, but I love to tour. But there's this reentry that comes every time I come on off the road. There's about a day where it just takes a minute to get mm-hmm. settled and in the groove, and and that's just jarring. And nothing ever gets unpacked, and everything's I'm transporting things back and forth. And so this year, I said I, I kind of wanted to work in chunks. So we did the Judge tour. We've got April and May off. No, March and April off. And then we were working in May, June, a little bit in June, July. Then we're going to do a tour in the summer and the fall for probably 15 dates. And then we always do a Christmas tour. So we'll probably end up doing the same amount of shows, but they're just spread out a little more. It's been a real treat. I appreciate you coming and just talking with me about like the stuff that I don't ever get to hear from you. Like I, I want to know about Sharon. Yeah. I want to know about your mom and your dad. Yeah. And so I hadn't heard this. So I really appreciate you taking an hour and spending it and Absolutely. sharing that with me. That's That's the coolest thing for me to get to do this. Um, so if you want to get tickets, you go to martinamcbride.com or go to our socials. Quite the Instagram following, I must say. <laughs> you kind of kill it over there. So, I love it. Yeah, it's fun. At Martina McBride. And then the, the final, final question. Do you still love singing? I do. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. And I think I'm learning to love it in a different way. Um, for a long time, it was just this thing I did. And it was just this... I sort of had complete control over it. I don't want to say I took it for granted. But, you know, now I'm older. I've gone through a couple of vocal issues, which I've been resolving, and I appreciate it more. And I think I'm more connected to it in a, in a, in a different way. And I think the next few years I'm going to enjoy it more than ever. Well, thank you for your time. This has been a real treat for me. Um, I guess that's it, right, Mike? All the stats and stuff we read before you got here. Yeah. Okay. All the we you know we. Didn't, I'm glad you didn't. We didn't do that while I was you. here. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't want you to get too cocky, you know. <laughs> yeah. all so, all right, Martina McBride, everybody. Mm-hmm.